The idea in 1901 was that the sun never set on the British Empire. We know that uh, far from the end of the century, the sun did set. And the fact is that many of the things that happened at the end of the century were inconceivable to many people. If I were to have described in 1901 the air war over Germany, it would have been dismissed as science fiction. Probably the single most important phenomenon in the world today is the declining birth rate. Birth rates per woman are declining in virtually every part of the world, in every country, in every demographic. For the past 500 years, the one thing everyone could assume was that there were going to be more people, more consumers, more producers, more soldiers. All that's going to change now. And that's not a forecast, that's an arithmetic certainty. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of a Delta II rocket and Ys. We are going to be looking for non-flossal fuels. Uh, certainly solar energy is the most efficient, but solar energy on the face of the Earth would be an ecological catastrophe. Even with advanced technologies, the amount of the United States, for example, that would have to be covered with solar collectors to replace the energy produced by fossil fuels uh, would be most of the Southwest. There is, however, a place where there is no such ecological impact, and that's in space, where solar collectors can collect free sunlight and beam it down to Earth in microwave radiation. We should bear in mind that not only NASA has a project along these lines, but that Mitsubishi has launched a project with a $20 billion investment to get solar energy going within the next 20 years, and Pacific Gas and Electric has contracted with the company to start buying solar-based energy in the year 2016. The United States constitutes about 25% of the world economy. That means one in every four dollars created in this world are created in the United States. The American military continues to be the dominant force, whatever problems they've had in Iraq. The U.S. Navy controls the oceans, the U.S. Air Force controls space. Since World War II, we've had four major financial crises. I regard the recent financial crisis as extraordinarily routine. And what makes it even more routine is the level of operatic hysteria we have seen. Because in every one of these crises, the declaration is made, this is the end of the world. The world will never be the same, but it usually is. We're already seeing economies recover, not magnificently, but certainly the dread that we had at a time when the hardcover edition of my book was published and where people said, well, you've got it all wrong, you've missed the fact that the world is ending, by now we see isn't the case. The U.S. economy is three times bigger than the Chinese economy. That means if the United States grows at 2.5% a year, the Chinese are going to have to grow at 8.25% a year, simply not to let the gap widen between the two countries. The idea that China is going to grow fast enough to overtake the United States in less than several generations at best is, I think, a very far-fetched idea. The thing that has to be understood about China is how extraordinarily poor it is. According to Chinese government figures, of the 1.3 billion Chinese, 600 million live in households, in households whose income is $1,000 a year or less. It is a China whose economy is essentially that of Sub-Saharan Africa. Russia is much weaker than it ever was during the Cold War. Russia today is a regional power. But within that region, it is a significant power. It's not a power to be taken lightly. It doesn't have the ability to influence events in Africa as it once did, but it does have the ability to shape events in what it calls its near abroad, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and places like that. It also has the ability to dabble in Middle Eastern affairs, and thereby uh, make the United States very uncomfortable. So certainly I see tension. 
I don't see a war, but I see rivalry and unease, but nothing to compare with the Cold War we saw.